Nice. Nice. All right. Here we go. Let's We're go. back. Episode 19, You Love to Hear It, a podcast presented by Athlete Studio, the number one e-commerce platform for athletes. And we got an absolute banger episode for you guys today. I don't know where Verde is, but in the next couple of minutes, he should be creeping in and sitting down. But I honestly don't even know how to introduce our guest who could take so many different routes from athlete to videographer, photographer, like creative genius, rock star, like every type of level, but we're literally just going to choose the route of introducing him as my brother. Yeah. That's, that's what we should do. Cause that other stuff is crazy. <laughs> we got Dana Willax, AKA kingdom of Dana, AKA D dub in the booth. What's going down, baby. How we doing, bro? You think that people know that you set this up like before we even introduced you? I mean, I love, I used to love the comments when I would come through and do the little like minute segments or whatever in the vlog. And they're like, you know, D-Dub was here. Instantly. D-Dub edit, D-Dub edit. Um, but we got to show some love to Jamal because we thought he was going to be back in the coming episodes here. But this man's is so deep in the family game. He's got a baby coming any day, any minute. So super tough to coordinate that. And just, you got to take care of what really matters. So Jamal, we love you. We're jumping into this. Like I said, we're going to have green hair soon, but I kind of want to break down how we started. If you guys listen to my bomb hole or even following me and my journey, you know, a lot of my background, obviously my brother went through everything that I went through and we don't want to get too deep off the rip, but I just want to kind of touch on like when we found skateboarding, how that was introduced into our life and snowboarding and surfing background. So like yeah. jump, jump into it with the skateboarding. When did we first start skating? <sighs> seventh grade for me. I didn't touch a skateboard till seventh grade. So I was like 12, maybe something like that. And I remember like sixth grade to seventh grade was just such a transformation of me. I like, remember like cut my hair and I picked up a guitar. I started skating suddenly had some friends <laughs> and it was, uh, it was just a whole new opened up everything for me. You know what I mean? A lot of driveway builds, a lot, a lot of, of basement builds. skating sessions, bro. Filming, tell the people about how we used to get our clips in grandma's, was it in grandma's Florida room where we would try to record the VHS and make edits from oh, for sure. We were, we were in a weird way, cutting tape. Like they used to do back in the day. Like we would, you know, we had the classic Sony handy cam, whatever parents, you know, whatever camera your parents had floating around that they brought on vacation. And it has the yellow, the white, and the red plugs and the VCR you record on the, on the camera and then plug it into the VCR and time it up, watch it on the TV press play on the camera at the beginning of the clip, press record on the VCR. Then when it gets to the end, boom, press stop. A little Next precursor clip. of what was to come in the future. How far it's come. It's <laughs> How crazy. far it's come. And I want to lead into some snowboarding too, because you have an insane background in snowboarding from a young age. You were throwing down, I believe almost you got 900s at no, one point. The 720s most, I for did sure. one 720 and it was, it was on a small jump, but I, I chucked it, you know, Eric Koch was there. That was sick. Was it Powder Ridge? No, it was at Waterville Valley. What was this pass that you had? That was, oh my God, we're just fast forward in the future when Sam Poli, Sam Powley, Sam Marinelli, yeah, whatever road you want to go down. We need a, we need a, a loudspeaker, <laughs> yeah, so show yeah. some love. Uh, when uh, her mom, Debbie, who was like a second or third or fourth mom to me, our town had just parents for everybody. It was so sick. But she opened up Montana's board sports and more skate shop, snowboard shop. And they had like, you know, they had all sports for all the kids too. They had baseball and all that. But uh, they got a gold pass. It was just called the gold pass. And we would go to the, all the demo days and try out all the boards and whatever these passes were, we were able to go to like any mountain and it wasn't for one person. You could just take the pass and transferable. Go. Yeah. There's pass. no pictures. Just if you'd had this pass, you were like in the industry and you got to ride. And so we were like 16, 15, 16, 17 years old, getting to just go to whatever mountains we wanted to with whoever we wanted to to bring sick so insane i was so jealous of that and it, fast forward another time you got hooked up with you were you were doing the standby flights for a while you freaking managed to to get <laughs> free passes and I free did. flights but <laughs> i was doing some c like c-dub stuff where with the with those passes i would have to 
get on a flight whenever there was a seat available. So like I stayed at the airport for like two days one time. Yeah. To save 250 bucks. Yeah. Like, at what so, point is it, is so it not insane. worth it? Yeah. Um, you've ridden loon. You have like a, a good background. When did you first snowboard and was it at Potter Ridge? <sighs> I would say Potter Ridge. There was the breath. There was, I was thinking there was the breath. Yeah. Oh, we're so <laughs> deep. Oh. Um, I am trying to think of my first time snowboarding and I do think it was at Powder Ridge. Yeah, it was at Powder Ridge because I had the skateboarding background, but in eighth grade, we had the ski and snowboard club, which is just the most epic thing of all time. They just, you signed up and you, if you skied or snowboard and you just, they just crammed a bunch of eighth graders on the bus with a few on teachers Friday or nights. whatever on Friday nights and Powder Ridge, just the most epic, like it gets made fun of, but it was just one of the coolest mountains ever. It was like, we were too young for it to be like that movie, uh, Out Cold. Is that yeah. what it was? Yeah, it, but it was, was like that, an eighth that was grade going version there. of yes. that. You know what I mean? So we would like we would take the bus out there, and I think they first first lesson or first day they made you take a lesson, and so I remember being on my board first time with a few other kids from my class and. It was just so easy immediately. <laughs> you know what I mean? Because it was just a skateboarding background Same, yep. and being on skis. I was yep. I mean, I started skiing. So we were on skis for, I mean, since I was five to when I was 12. Yeah. You know? And then before I was, you can even really walk, you're just like, just strap yeah. him in. He can slide down at least. So I got it. You know what I mean? And we, we were, chuck, I was chucking 360s on skis at 12. You yeah. Know, you know what I mean? And, um, but yeah, switching over to a board and then, um, yeah, I just remember being like, I'm not doing this, this lesson. Oh, we got this, you know? So then, yeah, it was just started there and going every Friday night and just like by the, I think that was the first year at Powder Ridge. There's still probably a video on YouTube, Bruce's fate of me. I was board sliding the sketchiest skinny down, flat loose down or, circle DFD, maybe a DFD FD. It was very weird. And I was chucking uh, back two seventies to the down. Yeah. Lip sliding through Lip the king. sliding through the, yeah. And I was doing back three tail fishes. It's like basically when you don't have like that much knowledge of how sketchy what you're even yeah. doing is. No and fear. you're just bolting stuff. Yeah. yeah. No bones. Yeah, baby. Yet. We got Verde hey, back. Slide through. Successful? Success. New bank account opened up. Yeah. Somewhere to put all the funds. Multiple, yeah. All the funds. He's apparently got that 6% interest, right? That no one else has ever yeah, heard of. What is going on <laughs> with that? Talk bro. to the corporate boys from back home. And he said, Marcus by Goldman Sachs. Send it. There you go. <laughs> Dude, Mike Green. You love to see him. I walk into here the first time you rode ever was Powder Ridge, and that was me too. Yep. Yo, That's a couple crazy. CT boys here. I'll never forget that first day. Yep. Me and Green were chilling in the uh chilling in the same towns and we didn't even know each other. I mean, I didn't did I even meet you until California? Or did no. I we never met on the East Coast? No, but we so were many at the of my Arts closest barns friends. and shows yeah. and, and toads we didn't even know. And, yeah. Imagine how many times we actually drove by each other driving to Crystal Mall. Oh <laughs> my Crystal god. Mall? Yeah. The outlets. Some of the, some of the Squamic how many times we drove by each other oh in traffic. My god. Yeah. Quick well, shout out my gang. Oh, for the boy, our, 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 our mutual friend that we both knew that and, but didn't know each other. So I kind of want to lead into wow. how you shifted towards music when you were still young, you were in high school yeah. and, um, yeah, what kind how the, the route from skateboarding, Ooh. snowboarding kind of shifted into playing guitar at first and, and leading into getting into a band. Yeah. Let's do that. I got basically got a guitar and a skateboard at the exact same time at, at Christmas of seventh grade and you know i tried to take the acoustic guitar class uh which, which didn't really do much i could kind of play a couple of the songs but um i was kind of just jamming green day and blink 182 and just learning all their songs on guitar while i was skating it was all kind of happening at the same time and then you know snowboarding took off in eighth grade but you know once i got into high school that's where the music stuff really started to come through and that's when i had my first band whether you want to call it Bly the Martyr or Killing the Life Inside or Miles to Go or whatever, but whatever we ended up being, but it was me and Joe Brayman, Sam Shattuck, Connor Burke, Steve, like we had, a, we had a band going, dude. And I was playing guitar in that and uh, we were just like, you know, Joe's background and was like super hardcore with like a hundred demons and hate breed and stuff like that. And then I was listening to like, 
life in your way. And oh, obviously in memory of courage was like the biggest, they were called flatline changed to a memory of courage. They were the easily biggest influence, like, like local legend, high school hero band that I still think like holds up to this day. Somehow they do. They do. Were you guys at their last show ever in Waterford? Oh, I was God. there. We were probably all on stage together. I found a mic on the ground and I got to see whatever that song was. The they're drowning. It's like the last song. They're was it? Was that when they still had Kyle or where it was? Uh, Kyle or was it Kyle Stone on vocals? You or Kyle? I would I don't think I would know that, but mm. it was their last show mm. ever. It's Salty we grave for sure. We were there. Yeah. So funny. Yeah, you played some. You played? Didn't you play at school one time? We literally played the like show? straight up like it was like it wasn't like a big and idle thing, but yeah, we literally did play like a talent show at the school and nobody knew what was happening. There was like three kids that knew what was happening. It was like Josh Parent, Storm, and that's about it. You know, and we were just throwing down on stage doing the guitar spins and Joe's just screaming. <laughs> yeah, we just played. We just played for the school. It was crazy. Whole crowd just like, what is going what on is going right now? Down. But also like, it taps into a little something in the back where they're like, that's what yeah, I kind of been feeling like that <laughs> too. You know what I mean, like, this is epic. But like, am I allowed? Right. Regardless, is this, is this like, okay. You know, inside of everybody, there's a little pent up. There's, some, there's, music. A, there's yeah, a breakdown I mean, in everyone. Yeah, I sure. mean, anybody who's ever hit in a PR in the gym has done it to a metal track. <laughs> yeah. Not a choice. Not a choice. <laughs> Whether it's on the loudspeakers or it just came through on Spotify. Yep. And so that kind of leads into like the next chapter, which is pre massive shift where you graduated high school mm -hmm. and you didn't really know or you thought you knew exactly what you wanted to do. You wanted to continue to pursue the music career. <laughs> And so the first thing you did was you went to Massachusetts, right? Yeah, UMass Lowell. I was basically just following what Sam Shattuck was doing because I didn't know what to do. I didn't like, I didn't really sit down with anybody and figure out school. I didn't know how to, you know, I did get letters of recommendation written for um, my uh, music technology teacher, which me and Shattuck and like Teddy Fawini and Theo Solo, Sowell were in that class. And that was cool, but like me and Shattuck excelled in that class. They got a bunch of Mac computers, a few interfaces and Pro Tools. And then they were like taking us through this curriculum. And it was like music theory meets music technology. But like the theory part of it wasn't what interested me. It was like recording music, this stuff right here, ins and outs and headphones and, you know, DAWs, whatever. And uh, so me and Shattuck like excelled in that class to where the teacher, Mr. Kerr, he just like came up to us and we basically had like a private study. He was just like, the rest of these dudes are just going to go through the curriculum, but you're excelling here. He's like, just come to me every week and show me what you're working on. Uh, and we'll just like take it. For, we'll just take it. That was me. Just, yeah. He said, just come to me with what you're working on. And you show me you're working on something and we'll just take it from there. Cause you guys are killing it. So that's what we do. And me and Shattuck ended up like recording the, the plays and the band concerts and all that setting up microphones and doing all that. So that's what made me want to go to UMass Lowell because they had a good recording program and I wanted to be an engineer, a music engineer and mixer master or whatever you want to say. So I basically followed Shattuck there because he was going there and I, I got it from him and I had no research. I didn't know anything. Mm -hmm. Shattuck being an absolute shredder on the guitar. Just the just best. Yeah. In, in the band with yeah, you. So, yeah. and so that didn't work out or while you were there, your energy yeah, I, shifted or what happened? Well, basically I went there and I scored 10 points too low on my SATs, or I think that's what it was to actually get into that major, but you could record, you could follow the music business major. And it was like the same curriculum in at, until two years, which then the SATs didn't matter anymore. You can just shift over or whatever. So you have the credits. So I went for music business. As soon as I got there, I was like, this is not for me. Like I didn't, I don't even remember signing up for classes. I don't remember like if I was even supposed to be, you just show up to classes. They don't like take your attendance. It's not like high school at all. I just didn't even know really what was going on when I got there. I was so surprised that there was a spot for me at the dorms. You know, I just like, I felt lost, you know, it's like, this it's incredible is how much they actually don't prepare you for even college, <clears throat> oh, which my. isn't even a preparement for the real world. No, I know. So like no one forces you to do anything either. You don't want to go to your class. There's, there's, you just don't go to your class. You're just going to fail the class. So you already paid. You already paid. We got your money. It's thirty grand to go here. You know. So yep. I basically, you know, just I really liked going to English class because it was like everything was cool with that, like language and you know writing and being creative and stuff. 
but like all this stuff, I felt like I was just back in high school because I wasn't, they weren't, they don't focus on the majors right away, you know? So next thing you know, I'm in like a calculus class and then all this, and I'm staying in the dorms and drinking, you know what I mean? And like tagging, you know, getting into the tagging around Massachusetts and stuff. It was crazy. You're just like, what am I doing? You know what I mean? This, what am I doing? I had no guidance. I'm just yeah. like going because you thought you had to. Yeah, exactly. And it's actually, now that I think about it, it wasn't <clears throat> music business. I think it was electrical engineering. I was like, I'll just switch to that. You know, my dad was a lineman. My grandpa was a lineman. I thought that was like that, but like electrical engineering is like building that, building a phone, you know, doing like that type of stuff where I was just like, what? So after a semester of being like, this is not for me, like I'm not mature enough or ready for this yet. At least I was mature enough to realize that I'm not mature enough to be unsupervised yes. in a dorm, you know. With, Awareness is everything. Yeah. The fact that they'll literally let you sign up for a class when you don't actually know what that class is, you know, Crazy. is just wild. So Crazy. then you shifted, you moved back to Connecticut, right? From Massachusetts. Yep. And I got moved out of the dorms and I moved back. I think I moved back home for a second mm -hmm. into Nagel's room because Nagel had moved to Norwich. And then I was like, I think I'm just supposed to be an electrician. So I was like, and like, I also went through this whole thing being like picturing my life as like a recording engineer and being like, when I'm 60 years old, do I want to be like recording bands, blah, blah, blah. And I like, I had this huge dilemma of fighting with like, going down this path that could be creative and cool, but as a huge risk, it's something that I would love to do or doing something where I can just get money and have a normal life. And coming from Colchester, that is just such a town where you have to make that decision, you know, cause you're not in California. There's, there's not a ton of like inspiration directly there. You have to like look for the inspiration there. The inspiration when you're growing up in Colchester, Connecticut is to get out of there. You know, it's when you move away for a long time where you realize what you had. And, and now like, you're that person inspiring other people. Totally. So you're looking up to literally like Mike Druskovich. For sure. We we just know him as this person who's just like in Hawaii, just like he exactly. graduated and was just like, you're like, well, this guy's living in a van. He's just surfing. You know, it's just like this misto thing. Yeah. And uh, yeah, so you went to to Barron. So I went to Barron Institute of Technology, which place is an absolute joke. All they care about is getting you in there. And once you're in there, they care about making it look good while you're there for other people coming in to look at the place so they can lock them in too. I remember when I went and did the walk around, everybody had their shirts. Everybody looks professional, tucked in, boots. Everybody's working. They got all these cool things. And they literally would schedule that stuff out when they knew people were coming in to look at the school, you know, so you would come in and people would be in the framed house inside this huge thing, running wires and stuff. But little did they know that these people like, Oh, your shoes untied 10 points off your, you, you get a hundred, you get a hundred points for the day. That's your grade for the day. Oh, oh 10 points off because your shoes untied 10 it's, points off because like your safety glasses are happy on. Gilmore with yeah. the grandma when she goes into the, the old home. Right. Yes. And they're all exactly. super happy. And then he leaves. Yeah. Goes, Shut up, grandma. You're going to bed. Let me get a glass of warm milk. How about a warm glass of shut the? <laughs> <laughs> so, how deep are you into this? Um, it, you graduated. I graduated. It's, it's a one year deal. It's a one year deal. And the way that this payment structure works, you pay for more of it than you pay ahead. So, I was just like, I, I knew probably halfway through, I'm never going to be an electrician. This is not for me. I need to be doing something more creative. And this is crazy. I can do this and it does interest me. The aspects of it interest me, but like, this is not what I'm trying to do. I'm not trying to be in Connecticut in, because what do you do in the winter? You know, there's still, these dudes are still out there working on houses in the winter in electrical, new construction, you know, when it's 30 degrees out, it's 50 different breed. degrees out. Dudes are animals. I'm like, I'm not trying to do that. So outside of high school, you tried two different things yeah. and you had the ambition and passion to do so, but then halfway through both times, you're like, I yeah. can't. Yeah. Like this, they were so Think about similar. how many people just, I got to fight through it and just yeah. do it. I fought through the Baron thing because it was, like I said, it was like a pay more than you were there. So I was like, I've already paid for this next semester. I'm like, they're not getting this money out of me. I might as well leave here with my, my degree or whatever, you know? So I left with my certificate of electrical technology, top of my class, crushed it while I was there, knowing I wasn't going to be an electrician, but knowing that that knowledge is clutch. And now with kingdom, how many times I've rewired our trailer, 
You know what I mean? Our trailer lights and I can do all that. And so I, it's coming things. clutch. You know, it's coming clutch a bunch. But. Yeah. The stove in Colchester. We don't, we don't talk about the stove in Colchester. <laughs> <laughs> so I want to ask it. Do you think that the shift from the original career that you wanted to from the SAT scores, is that what shifted away from it? Like if you had gotten into that first one, you know, cause you said you shifted yeah. from going into what you wanted to, to more yeah. of like a business style. Do you think you would have kept wanting to do that first career? If I went to UMass Lowell and I had more preparation for everything and I got there and I knew I was going to have a spot in the dorm and I had talked to teachers and there was something, I knew I had classes signed up and I was in the, uh, recording part of the, the field that you want the field I want. And we dove straight into recording and I was recording people all the time. I probably would be so deep. And I mean, I'm, am still so deep in recording yeah. right now. I can set all this up and I record everything for all, for my band and stuff. So, um, which is the best aspect of it, just jumping into it and getting the experience. Yeah. And the, the best aspect of school is all that extra knowledge where they force you to study like the the, yeah. the little stuff that actually is really good. But when you're not allowed to do that and they kind of force you into a different route that yeah. isn't what you want, and then that makes you want to kind of redecide like, is this even the creative way? Am I blowing it and not doing what I want? So to do the barren thing yep. and then realizing, no, I did want to do the creative that's the massive shift I was talking about. When did you realize that you wanted to move to California and say, I'm just going to bail on the insane amount of money that I just invested in all of that and try to start a whole new life out there? I always think back to being in eighth grade and when they made us uh, like build our first websites, we had to like get creative and name the site. And it was like something, something, something.com slash your site. Right. And I remember mine was all surfing and all like Hawaii, California themed. And it was like, it was just like, it was like we Willie site or something, something random. And it was just everyone likes, I remember at that moment, everyone like looking at me and being like, you're supposed to be in California. And I started getting told that. And I was like, I think you're right. And maybe I am supposed to get out there to California, you know? And it all came down to when mom was selling our house that we grew up in, in New Hampshire or sorry, in Connecticut. And she was moving to New Hampshire and it came down to three options. I can move with my mom to New Hampshire and go live in New Hampshire. I could get an option. I could get an apartment in Colchester, or I could do literally anything else besides those two things. And I was like, who do I know? What kind of connections do I have around the country? So I called Aunt Bonnie, my our dad's sister, who lived in the Bay Area of California, up in Northern California. And I called her up and I was like, I can do anything I want right now. I graduated from school. I am wondering if it'd be cool if I came out and visited you for a couple of weeks to see if I like it there. And if I like it, can I come live with you for a little while until I get on my feet? I want to move to California. And she was like, absolutely like no issue whatsoever. I, I'm so happy this is happening. That's amazing. Yep. So I sent it. I think you sent it with me on the first trip. Did you send it with me on the first trip out there? Is oh that might have been what it was. Yeah. We went out together to see her. I can't Either remember. Either that or we went out a little bit before that. And then that's what made you want to make that commitment right there. What year are oh, we in right man. now? 2009, maybe. 2009. Well, I graduated in 2006 and then I went to UMass Lowell in 2006. So, still, so right? this was this was 2008. 2008. That makes sense. Because yeah. I had just graduated and you, you moved graduated. out there and I ended up staying in Colchester because I had the same dilemma yeah. and I had a girlfriend and I was, I had mm. a job and I was super locked into my hometown and you sent it and watching you rekindle your love for skateboarding. Oh yeah. As soon as you got there was what like really got me so stoked and made me and B-Dub come out and you had a brand new Ranger because you started working for Serta Pro and kind of walk us through moving to California and being by yourself. You had the support of our aunt, but she was working like you're completely by yourself, new oh, yeah. area. What, how did, how did you approach that? That was the point in my life where the most, the most important thing to me and this new like ideology I had was get uncomfortable being uncomfortable and put yourself in uncomfortable situations so that when you're, you can get through them easier. You can any, when every time, anytime one presents itself, it's so much easier than it was. So it's like no friends, no job. What do you do? And I always look at things as what's the first step I can take to alleviate this scenario. You know, like 
you can't like, as soon as you start looking at something as like too big of a picture, it gets so daunting. You know, if you're trying to learn a new language and you look at the whole realm of the language, it's like, I will never figure this out. But if you just start with a few words and then add a few words, it's like anything you can do that. So when I moved out there, I didn't have a job, but I had 10 years of painting with courier painting. Shout out courier painting. All the boys work there. Yep. Crazy. Um, so I needed to get a job. So I just jumped on Craigslist, tried to find a job, found a job with a painting company, Serta Pro Painters. And they weren't even hiring a painter. They were hi hiring someone to go around neighborhoods and hang door hangers and try to get leads. But I went in for the interview, got that, and talked to him. I was like, I'm actually a painter. And someday it would be cool if like I could work for here as a painter instead of the door knocker, you know? So, but I proved myself to him. And then I was a painter. Uh, he hired me as a painter and there was like 30 guys on the crew. I was the only white dude, hilarious, trying to just like fit in, you know what I mean? And, um, uh, while getting commission from the door leads too, right? Sort like of, you were but kind I, of working your way up. Yes. So I remember I at one point you won some awards. Well, that was next. So after I was painting for a while, I was, I, I honestly think as much as of a good painter as I think I am. I was just no match for these dudes. Yeah. <laughs> They're just yeah. crushing no, me. You the know? motivation's unrivaled. Yeah. But they, uh, where, where I did excel was with the customers. You know what I mean? They, I could just like easily have conversations and like build rapport or whatever. And so while I was still painting a little bit, my, uh, my boss, Sumil, absolute legend, like every person that I met along the way in my life was such a crucial element to literally sitting in this chair today. It's insane. Sue Mill, shout so, out yeah, to Sue Mill leading down that road. Shout out to Sue Mill. Shout out to every single person that I met throughout my life just being so iconic and why I'm sitting where I'm sitting today. Everyone was just crucial. So he saw something to me and he wanted to hire me to basically take his role as a salesperson. You know, so he wanted to get out of that role and he wanted me to, he just wanted to own the company, you know, be involved in other ways. But he was the one that uh he was the one that like saw something in me and he wanted me to take his role and he just wanted to own the company and do some things here and there. So then I came in and, uh, he started teaching me how to write contracts and go estimate houses. And like, all of a sudden, like I'm just making pure commission. I make no hourly, but he gave me a Serta pro car wrapped lime green toaster scion the XB or whatever. <laughs> I'm ripping that thing around everywhere I go, completely wrapped in Serta Pro. Wow. You pay for my cell phone. And then, but there was no hourly. It was just, I had to land the job and I would make 7% of whatever that was. So all of a sudden, like when I started getting good at that and all of a sudden I was making like a G a week and I was like, I am good to go for life. That's huge. Yes. Huge. Especially in 2008. It was insane. Yeah. You know, I don't have car payment. I don't have... You know, I was like, this is insane. So that's how I got into that role, at least the, the Serta Pro role, which down the line is insane because they have connections everywhere. So when I was able to move to Southern California, I just hit, told them that I worked at the Serta Pro up north. And then I got Mike D a job there and it just snowballs like crazy. Every decision you make can just, you, you got to look at every decision you make as just a new door to more opportunities. Okay. And so as you're doing this insane job, you're also juggling skating, making new friends, okay, filming yeah. parts. There's that entire background, but then there's another th part where you're, you're, you're trying to find another band. And I don't actually know how this story lays out, but I'll I know from, thing. from discovering Bagel and his other band connect us to how crazy. before Kingdom of Giants was Kingdom of Giants, who they were and, and how that began and how you navigated working and, and doing totally. that and bringing music back into your life. Totally. I mean, if we want to talk about the skating real quick, that has all to do with the same thing of getting uncomfortable. 
or getting comfortable being uncomfortable and putting yourself in uncomfortable situations. And I was like, I need to make some friends. What are people doing? What I like to do? I like skating. I was like, not really in music at this at right now at this point. So I was just like, I got to go to the skate park. So I went to the skate park and was just skating and there was kids there and I was like, find some kids my age and just like chat it up. So I just chatted it up with these kids at the skate park. And next thing you know, they asked me, do you want to go like to this spot? And I'm like, yes. My answer to everything those days was yes. You know, I was like freaking uh, Jim, Jim Carrey. Carrey. I was going to say I was Jim movie. carrying it. I had to yes, man, a lot of stuff uh, mm-hmm. just to be in the situation. Next thing you know, like Gabe <laughs> became a huge icon in my life. He took me around all the spots in um, – Gabe was literally a homie 10, 20 years older than you randomly looked yeah. at the same age looked and had been age. shredding and in the game forever. Oh, yeah. I remember watching your skating because I was almost like stopping skating yeah. around that time. That's when I was like peaking in my alcohol consumption and yeah. just like lost in my hometown and watching you start putting out full parts or at least like parts. Yeah. Relearning front side flips and back side flips up euros and feebles and crooked is just bodying these so rails sick. was like super inspirational. I almost have to ask you, how is your prefrontal cortex? Straight. <laughs> how is your prefrontal cortex? It's we'll straight. Have, we'll have to Going bring that clip up. Uh, there's I feel like a clip there's of, at of, least five clips that need to get brought up when this is getting edited. Oh, there'll be a somehow. lot of clips on the screen for yeah. sure. But Dana had a, an interview with a the newscaster rolled up to the skate park and was just trying to kind of clown on skateboarders. And like, he asked him all this stuff. Dana answered it all proper. And the one clip they used was him being like, so how's your prefrontal how's cortex? How's your prefrontal cortex? And Dana's response was straight. It's straight. And that's all they used on the news. Oh straight. My. They came to they came to the skate park and they were trying to do like these studies are saying that people's prefrontal cortex is underdeveloped and that's what it's before they're 25, which is all true. But that's what leads them to do risky things like skateboarding and blah, blah, blah. Uh, and it shows me like skating in the slamming. background. Yeah. So it's like they see me like skating in the background while this guy's like narrating this thing. And it's like, take Dana Lilix. It says my last name wrong. Age 20. Who's who's something is speed more than moderation or whatever, whatever he said. And then it cuts to how's your prefrontal cortex. And I'm just like, it's straight, but like I gave him a huge long interview and that's all they used to try to make me look bad. But little did I know it made me look the coolest I've ever looked in my entire <laughs> fucking life. <laughs> so kingdom. So kingdom. Yeah. So basically now, um, yeah. So now I'm, Living in, you know, the Bay Area with my aunt and my cousin Roxanne lives out there too, her daughter. And we had we were super close in age, but we always lived all the way across the country and we never got to hang, but I always knew we would be tight. So we did. Uh we hung out a little bit there and I was like playing guitar, but I had never been a vocalist at this point ever in anything. I just was always a guitar player, but I always drove around screaming in my car to in memory of courage and life in your way. I always we all do. Vocals. Yeah, the, <laughs> people ask, how'd you get into it? I'm like in my car. They're like, how do you practice now? I'm like in my car. Yeah. It's the only place to do it. Yeah. It's the only safe zone. <laughs> yeah. That's Pull up to a stoplight and you're like, people next to you are like, oh, fuck it. No. It's like people say you're singing in the shower. Like this type of stuff, you're not really singing in the shower. No. You're, you're in your car. It's blasting. You think you sound like the guy because you kind of hear it yeah. in the background. You're like, yeah, the I reverb of the this. car. Slowly turn it down and you're, you're, you're like, like, I am not dog me. Maybe I shouldn't do a feature. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah. So her friend at the time, Ian, his name's Ian Sykes, he played guitar and he was into the same type of music as me, but it was more down like, fall of troy dance gavin dance kind of more technical stuff but him and i like jammed together on guitar one time and we had a good time and he's like you want to start a band and i'm like yeah i could start a band let's do this so next thing you know we're on craigslist looking for band members wasn't his dad his dad was a bass player for boston for a while which is absolutely yeah i'll be wild. insane yeah let's start a band of course so i was playing guitar he was playing guitar and we found this kid, Jason Ramos, on Craigslist, and he was looking to start a band, and he had a couple members too. So we all joined up, and we had me, Ian Sykes, one of my best friends ever who I haven't talked to in a while, which sucks, but his name is Will Smith. And then uh, me, Ian Sykes, Jason Ramos, Will Smith, and Jay. Do you remember the dude, Jay? Did yes. you ever meet Jay? Rooftop Jay. He was the vocalist. And... Um, <clears throat> Then we also got this kid, Gino. So we had all this, I think actually, yeah. So we started jamming. Everything was cool. 
we're like, wow, we're actually like starting a band here. And when you're starting a band, you just like, you think like get signed, you know, and that's it. Everything changes, you know? And so everyone was just like trying to write music and we got in the studio. Eventually Ian had to leave. I can't remember why. I can't remember if we asked him to leave or if he left on his own, but Ian ended up leaving. And that's when we got Gino. And then we got Bagel. Oh my God. It's so confusing to try to piece the timeline all together. So we had me on guitar, Gino on guitar, Will Smith on bass, Jason on drums, Jay on vocals, and Bagel on synth and cleans. Sick. All right. Bagel was in a band called Hello Sailor at the same time. And we always looked at that like as his side band, like this is his band, but hello sailors, that's his side band. But he always talked about it. And we always had this like weird, like jealousy towards it. This like weird, like, like, yeah, whatever, you know, we don't care about King about hello sailor, blah, 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 you know, but they actually were doing pretty legit, but we just didn't want to really, they had like EP together, recordings, all sorts of stuff. And they were going to the same, they went to the same guy that we recorded our stuff with because bagel connected, connected us all. So we went to go record our first few couple songs and the screamer dude, Jay didn't show up to the recordings and we're at the studio. Everything's recorded. All we needed to do is vocals, which is hilarious because it's the exact same way I got into kingdom, but I was the only one that could scream. And they were like, why don't you just scream? We're here. Just scream on the tracks. So I screamed on the two tracks that we did. And we're like, all right, cool. Let's look for a vocalist. We're kicking out Jay. So we kicked out Jay. I was staying, still on guitar. We're looking for a vocalist, looking for a vocalist, looking for a vocalist. We can't find anybody. Eventually they're like, dude, it'd be so much easier to find a guitar player and have you be the vocalist. And I'm like, all right. I never knew I was going to be a vocalist or thought about being a vocalist, but I'm, I'm down. So I think that's when we found Gino or somebody that, and then I moved to vocals and then, uh, yeah, we played a couple shows. Things started getting serious with, uh, with kingdom and I went up, up is to, it hello sailor or kingdom? It's still hello sailor. <clears throat> they were, they were in the process of changing their name to kingdom of giants when the EP that they were recording was going to come out. So I go to support bagel at a show. I'm going to go watch my boys band. I've never seen them. Whatever. I go up to Jackson with where they all live to like hang out with them before they all go to the show, meet all them, go to the show. Their vocalist doesn't show up. Oh, I don't know any of the songs. I get on stage and scream random shit. No. For their whole set. Crushed it. For them. This is the abominable? Yes. This was abominable live. This was abominable live. That was not recorded yet. (gasps) Actually, it was recorded. The instrumentals were recorded. Not released. Not released. (gasps) I get on stage and just wing it find parts that just feel right and just start screaming random stuff. Bagel singing. They're doing their thing. You're kidding. Crowd. They were big, like King, like hello sailor, like had a good name for the local scene. So they were killing it. They were like, everyone loved it. Crowd was going nuts. Crowd was going nuts. Nate was there. Josh Reeves was there. Johnny was probably there. Hold on. Can you back up? Where are you? You're in in, California. Yes. This is Northern California, California, outside of Sacramento. And hello sailors from Sacramento. Yeah. Okay. Ish. The woods outside of Sacramento, but yeah. So I'm like off stage now and everyone's talking, mingling after. And Josh Reeves was like, was like, dude, your new vocalist is sick. And they're like, oh, that that's not our new vocalist. He, he just like kind of helped us out tonight, whatever. And he was like, well, he should be. And I was like, thanks, man. That's cool. Whatever, you know, blah, blah, blah. My band's falling apart at this point. You know, it's just, it was just the classic things that people don't understand as a local band, like letting just the littlest things come between you and like not getting your way. And it was just all this stupidest mm-hmm. stuff that you could ever let wreck your dreams wrecks. So many just mm-hmm. local bands, just button heads and not knowing how to just get past stuff. Yeah. The living situation affects the creative partnership. Oh, oh, for and sure. It's like, you guys shouldn't be living together. You should be creating music together. Yeah. And then when that starts to tie in, you start to, uh, yeah. Stuff just gets crazy. The Narvi's tight quarters. Yeah, yeah, you gotta totally. have a, you gotta have a select few. Yeah. So the album recording. So comes. then the same exact scenario happened. These kids had their instrumentals all done. They had two days left of recording time on their budget for this guy, Daniel Castleman. And, uh, 
they're like, would you come down and track on our EP? We only have two days and they had six songs and I had nothing but red had everything written vocally already. So we, I went down to San Diego. I was like, I'm going down to San Diego to record an album. Like, let's go. So I went with them and me and red literally sat, I sat in a chair like this with an SM seven B and red sat next to me. And he would look at his notepad and he would feed a <clears> lot. <throat> tell me the line, tell me the pattern. I would bust out the line. We would move on next line, next line, six songs, knock them out in two days. That was my tryout for kingdom. And they were stoked. It worked out. They wanted me. And the album dropped. And the album. Well, first, the craziest thing happened first. We recorded that in like the summer. And then in October of that year, we got a tour offer because we had management through Outer Loop Management with this dude, Brian Judge and Derek Brewer. And they put us on tour with volumes. It was their first oh. tour and our first tour. And we were just supporting volumes. We had no music out, boys. <laughs> The album hadn't dropped. The album's not out. We go on tour. They have an album out. They're crushing it. People know their stuff. The shows are still small. It is their first tour too, off their first EP. So there, people know them singing their words. They, they they have people after the show like being like, "Hey, you're good to. Do you want to come crash? You can come crash at our spot tonight because the shows we're getting paid like a hundred dollars total. So it's barely enough gas to get to the next show. So you're sleeping in the van. So we would be so jealous when people would be like. We we're like, what are you guys doing tonight? You going to a Walmart parking lot? Because that's what we would do. And they'd be like, oh no, this kid who's who's letting us crash at their spot. And we would be so jealous that they got like showers they had fans. to go inside. Yeah, we we're jealous. And I remember, and now I look at the amount of things that I look back on of how I acted in our band and looking at it now, I'm like, are you out of your mind for what you thought what you were doing right? You know? And this is one of them being like jealous and be like, dude, you didn't have music out. And you're literally getting jealous watching volumes. With people know their words. Yeah. It's crazy. What do you expect? What did you expect? So I want to take a step back yeah. because there was a moment when you were starting to shift more towards the band yeah. and a tour got offered to it's you that guys. Tour. It was that tour. That so let's tour. take a step back real quick. You're also working for Serta Pro. Yep. There was that story I was trying to squeeze out of you where you hit number one sales or something. Oh, and yeah. you were you were in a collared shirt giving a, a fucking speech at <laughs> yeah. an event for, for marketing sales or something like that. Yeah, I go randomly. Big blue eyed it. Dana. <laughs> <laughs> I was the youngest uh sales rep in Serta Pro nationwide. There's like a million for like California probably has 10, yep. you know. And so nationwide, I was the youngest salesperson in the con in the uh, company. And they do like a conference every year. They were doing a conference there. So we go and um, they, someone gets on stage and talks about like they teach more sales stuff or they see how the company's doing, the growth, all that CEO freaking stuff that is whew, so out of our, out of my world right now, you know? You won some bisque. So I mind. had, well, I happen to have the highest SR, which is success ratio out of any salesperson in the whole company. <laughs> so I had the most going to in estimate and landing the job. Mm -hmm. That percentage was higher than anybody's in the whole country. So what they give you? They, they gave me a handshake. So I had to get, so no, so I, I, I was in like, you know, a button down and all that. And I had to get, they literally called me up on stage and I had to go up on stage in front of all these people, you know, like in an auditorium and shake the dude's hand. He gave me an iPad he gave me like 400 beans cash. Okay, there it is. That's what I was trying to say. Okay, I thought yeah. it was more. Yeah. A couple hundred bucks. Yeah, 400 nice, bucks. Though. I was like, Huge. let's go, yeah. you know? Uh, 400 bucks cash, an iPad, a handshake. And uh, oh, they gave us a, uh, they gave me and Sumil a, the two night stay for free in Vegas. And we got this, the penthouse suite. But, yes. but the stipulation was like, we had to, we had to um, entertain at that point. So like everyone was allowed to come up to our room, like, not everybody, because there was like 800 people, but like certain the higher up people mm. come to the room and like chat with us and bullshit. And me and Sumil really just wanted to Chill. get shit faced. Really, yeah. really. <laughs> yeah. That's twenty one. You know? <laughs> yeah, I was twenty one. Yeah, and I was in Vegas for the first time, and Sumil was like one of my best friends. Also, so uh, yeah, again, I, and I had to say a speech. I had to get up there, and they're like, "So what did you do? What did you? Uh, how did you get the success ratio? Blah blah blah." And I had to like stand up in front of all these people, and I just like. Come up with something. 
I on the spot, yeah, I prepared nothing, obviously. And on the spot, I was like, I really got to hand it to Sumil. He's an awesome teacher. He he taught me everything that I know. You know, I just honestly go up there and I just try to keep it real with the people because I know I cannot stand people trying to sell to me and I can see right through it when it's happening. Ugh. So I just go up there and I don't force nothing on anybody and I just talk to them like they're real people. I think being a painter and having a painting background, they trust me because I can actually talk about the process, you know. Whatever I said, I don't remember, but uh, they loved it and it was cool. And uh, yeah, won that contest. Yep. So I was leading into that because basically, as you can see from the outside perspective, you've moved to California. You put your main dream, the music career on hold for a second to do the painting, to get stability. Your Our aunt's hooking you up with a place to crash. You start to dial yourself in. You got a car, you got a rig, you got a job, you're making bread. You start to tap back into your true love, which is music and everything. And then all of a sudden that tour, which you explained, yeah. pops up out of nowhere. Yeah. And there was a huge moment in your life when you asked to go on the tour yeah. and you needed to either quit or something. And you, and like you said, everybody that's, that has, you've met in your life has helped you out for you to be in that position. Let's, let's hear that little backstory of that. Yeah. He, uh, Sumail it comes down to him. Um, I, I went in, I sat down with him and I was like, I have this tour coming up. I need a month off. I was like, is that, is that possible? Can we do this? And he kept it real with me, which I appreciate because if he had given me that month off, what would be different now? He he told me, listen, I'm hiring you to take my job because I have my dream. And if I let you pursue your dream, that means it puts my dream on hold. He's like, and I can't do that. He's like, so I support you and want you to go on this tour, but I have to let you know that I'm, I would have to hire somebody else to take your role and your job won't be here when you come back. And I was like, I get it hundred percent. You got to do what you got to do. And I have to bail. So I left that job to go on tour with kingdom. How many people wouldn't have done that? <sighs> oh, I'm going to come back. I can't pay rent. I got a car. No, I can't pay the like year. Yeah. That's a sad. Well, that's move. crazy is that, um, <clears throat> you know, at that time you think like you're going on tour, you're about, your band's about to blow up. You know, it's like you have these such jaded or whatever. I'm not sure what the term is. I guess jaded views on what could, or what you think is about to happen with your band when you're young. It's just or how quickly it's how quickly gonna it's going to happen, how big it's going to get, money, you know, blah blah blah. And you're just definitely wrong about it, <laughs> you know. Um, so I was like, I got to do this tour. You know, I'm glad I did because it, it that was my comfortability, and I left my comfort. And at that point, I had my dream truck. I bought a 2003 Tacoma. In 2010, you know, it was a banger. I was financing it, but I had to have, it was 300 bucks a month and it was 300 bucks a month insurance on top of that. So I'm paying 600 bucks a month financing this truck that had to go. Wow. That's gone. Sold that. I think I maybe started driving your truck. I don't know what I had at that point. Yeah. I was leaving my rig out there, the Ranger. The yeah. But was that happening already? For a while. Um, well, I just remember that there was times when you were, in between tours, you'd be broke for the tour. You'd get whatever you could do. And then you'd go home and you would crash with the band. You guys basically had like a band house. There's there's different levels of which band house, but you would work. I remember you were working for your tattoo artist, shoveling oh, yeah. potholes or, or fence posts for t 10 or t 12, 15 bucks an hour. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I don't know if there's like a, a story or a side that you want to share more intel on that, but just the fact that you were trying to accomplish your dreams and you bailed out on thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars, dream, dream money, dream car and everything to, to chase that. Like, what do you have to say to people who, who would be unsure if, if they should make that move? Start making sacrifice people. It's the only way to do it. I mean, I can, I can literally list off five people. That have done that. It's crazy. Dossie, Sammy, Mike, like everybody goes to school. I see people do both. I see people do this world first, grind things out and follow their dreams and then sort of get like eventually get burnt out on it. They're like, all right, time to settle into a normal life. And they'll go into that world. Mm -hmm. And then they'll always miss this whole life, but it's cool. And they're what, Gucci. They're accepted into that world totally. immediately. And the whatever it may be good. is like the job can yeah. get the, like you start building on that foundation. Yeah. But the opposite is more, more often where someone doesn't follow their dreams, does exactly what they think they're supposed to do, 
Or we're told to do. Or told to do. And then bail on it and then eventually become the person they're supposed to be like Dossie, you know. They're uncomfortable being uncomfortable. Yeah, comfortable so they, being uncomfortable. Well, no, they're, they're, they're Oh, yeah, opposite. they're uncomfortable being... Yeah, they're like, I got to get comfortable <laughs> yeah. being so, uncomfortable. Yeah, so I'm trying to gear shift this towards like when I enter the picture, but yeah. first we have to figure out when does the album drop? How many tours did you do? You're in Northern California yeah. working Well, I was that. in... I mean, you had come down, you had come visit at that point for sure. You had come out and we had done our Tahoe trip and the Ranger, um, B-Dub had come out, um, and we had done that, that whole trip, but I had moved down to Huntington before that first tour and I got that first tour. Well, I got the first tour at the exact same time as I was moving down to Huntington, really. Okay. So I, I wanted to say, because I remember how you told me you got that Huntington house you were looking online and you couldn't find anything for a while. And I found, then you made a, a trip down there, right? Well, I found basically me and my girlfriend at the time found three spots. We were living in Oakland and then I found, I think I found two, like two or three spots in Huntington that were potentials that I saw online. So we made the trip down there and we drove around and they were just so out of the question when we got there. It was like not it was so expensive or whatever the case may be. They were just all no goes. And we were like, damn, we just drove all the way down here. And I remember being in that dairy queen parking lot, that drive through next to TK burger right there. Yep. And I remember being getting stuck behind somebody in the line. Cause I wasn't even trying to go to the D the dairy queen. I just didn't know the area at all. And I just mm -hmm. kind of got jammed in there. Something negative you would assume. Yeah. So I tried to back out. So I started backing out of the, uh, dairy queen drive through. And I remember my girlfriend at the time being like, being like, what are you doing? Like being bummed on it. I'm just yep. like, I'm just like, made me want to do it more for some reason. Yep. Like, so I, I just did it and I ended up going down that alley that's right there and taking a right. And then boom, now I'm on second and Walnut and there's a for rent sign at the freaking gem of a spot in Huntington for a G bar a month for a one bedroom. Looked absolutely nothing like any house around there. Just like this like weird, charismatic little shed thing. And I'm just like, this is what we're looking for. Yeah, little dream beach house. Yeah. And I just want to say how often I push that the universe, when you put the work in and go and position yourself in the area that you want to be and surround yourself with what you want to be, so many more opportunities and options show up for you. Yeah. And that's just such a clear example of that. You you do the work, <laughs> you do the diligence, you find three places, you go down south, you look around because you put all that work in. Now you're in the area where you can just look over and see yeah. it for sale sign and it's just going to attract right to you. Insane. So when that album dropped, this was... Has, has the album dropped yet? Album dropped in January, January 25th, 2011. So it still hadn't dropped yet. I think it's out. But you were on tour. I was on tour in that October and then the album came out in January. And me and Mike Green didn't know who we were, but I remember I was still in Colchester living yeah. at B-Dub's house and B-Dub rolled into my room and literally goes, dude, your brother just dropped an album. I had never heard the pre- pre-recording things. Right. I didn't know what tour you were on. You know what I mean? There right. was no music going on. And... It was the most insane moment of my entire life. I had feelings that I've never experienced. We were so hyped. We couldn't believe what? that you just came out of pocket with this, with a full EP and you were on vocals. Last I, you know what I mean? You were yeah. shredding guitar last I knew and skateboarding, talking about prefrontal cortex stuff. <laughs> and it was just like, I don't know if it was like that. And then the combination of Druskovich coming back and introducing me and beat up into the law of attraction and then seeing you be in Southern Secret. California and touring and all that going on. And it was just like, I need a massive shift in my life. Everything that I had up to that point was just like, I could just tell that I, I wanted something else that I didn't know. Yeah. And if you've, if you've heard my bomb hole, I've talked all about how we went to Mount Hood and then that attracted B-Dub and then that figured out how we wanted to move West and I put out the sponsor me video on sponsorme.com, which got some sponsors to support the travel. And it like all came together at the same time. And I quit my job and I sold everything I own and we moved to Mount Hood with B dub and we were snowboarding and we did our first summer there with Bon Iver and Global Mind Elevation. They were paying us and we were stoking everything, which is so heavy. And we drove down. This was in this had to have been maybe that, f that following uh, August or September mm -hmm. and you had still had that place, but you weren't there. You were literally on tour and I had never been to Southern California. Uh. And literally one of the best moments of my entire life was me and B-Dub driving through the night. We arrived in Huntington Beach at like 10 o'clock. We rolled into your place. 
there was just a little pooch, nobody else. And it was this like tiki mini chalet of just beach dreams. It was like a chief house. Yeah, it was like a chief house motel and type beat. Me and B dub were just like mind blown that this was what you were living. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? Because Instagram wasn't even a thing back no, then. So people all, weren't yeah. just bragging about their peak moments. And I literally ollied a 10 stair that night. On the Huntington boardwalk for the first time in so long, we went skating around and like just the smell of the ocean, skateboarding, like being back because I had stopped for a while and then like snowboarding, reunited my skateboarding. And Mm -hmm. then like, I just remember that that was like such a huge moment in my life, seeing how hard you were crushing it and like your whole energy and everything you did drew me there sick and was just like yeah it it was just next level i feel like i needed to bring that up that's so sick i didn't even know anything about like you hearing that album for the first time and all that that's so sick to hear and meanwhile i just figured out music torrents on (laughs) on mp3 boo and that's i saw the album the crazy colors of the monster shout out dan mumford doing everybody's artwork like leaking or i don't even know what it was and me and my buddy sean douglas He's just like, yo, this band Kingdom of Giants is sick. And I, I was know, like, you knew about that either. Yeah. And he he told me about that site. So I somehow got it on my computer who I don't even know what I put it on, like an iRiver. Remember an <laughs> iPod, but it was an iRiver. It was like the knockoff version. And I was jamming that. Dude, I remember being honored because this dude, Johnny Beans, he was the torrent guy for the metalcore. And he he ripped our stuff and put it, he was the one that put it up for download, you know, to torrent. And like we didn't care. Oh, at the torrents. We were, were we were stoked because we felt like honored that we were like good enough to him or whatever to get uploaded by him so people could get our so sick. stuff for free. Yeah. That's how you steal music without using LimeWire. It <laughs> yeah. was like after LimeWire. I don't even know what the deal is. You know yeah. so much more, but Torrance were sick. Oh, for yeah. consumers, the bands were probably like, yo, buy our album. Yeah, eventually. And I'm like... <laughs> it's kind of like that with content now. And like people will... Like people could take this podcast, download it, and just start ripping clips yeah. and make little portions and create an entire Instagram, which people literally should do. Yeah. And I know... At first, a lot of creators were like, yo, they're stealing my content. They're not tagging, like all this stuff. But at the end of the day, like you have people like micro working for you yeah. that are sending it to an audience of people that would have never seen your stuff. Yeah. As long as it's growing you, you know, and there depends how much they're making monetizing if they're monetizing it, you know. <laughs> I mean, if it's growing your audience, like it's going to bring more people over to you, which builds your monetization. Yes. Yeah. yeah, it's crazy. It's time to jump into a little stoke here. We got G of the Week presented to you by Athlete Studio, the number one e-commerce platform for athletes. And basically, they hook you guys up with free merch every week. All you have to do is submit a clip. We don't have any clips yet because we're just jumping into this. So I picked one. And... He actually has already won before, but homie's just been on an absolute tier. And we want to show the boy some love and get him dialed with some fresh gear. So... Faraday knows. When the rail game is just so on point, and then you see that, yeah, well-rounded. Oh, honestly making Skyler proud. Oh, Nikki. Nikki Fox. So that was the homie Nick Fox. And once again, this is presented by Athlete Studio. If you guys want to potentially win that, all you have to do is go to the You Love to Hear It Instagram and drop us a DM with your clip, or you can hashtag YLTHI podcast and or hashtag G of the week. And then we're also going to pick one person and give them a $50 credit to the website. And that is just for tagging us or using those hashtags once again in any clip that you have or photo where you've copped merch. So we got this homie right here, this homie Matt from Australia who hit me up and sent me the fact that he just claimed he claimed it is one of the first orders and uh 
to pay for shipping overseas is the next level. So we're going to hook you up, homie. Once again, huge shout out to Athlete Studio for supporting hashtag G of the week and hashtag YLTHI podcast or tag us in any of your clips to potentially be featured and win yourself a hundred bucks or 50 bucks to my website. If you guys are trying to cop some merch and support www.caseywillax.com. We got all that you love to hear at gear and uh, yeah, appreciate you guys. G of the week. That's sick. <clears throat> Nick is in fact an absolute gangster. Nice. <clears throat> Whew. So let's, yeah, let's, let's jump into some more of, of the KOG. We, we went from small town, no album to me being overseas with you yeah. guys on your third album release. Uh, uh, like at what point did KOG just completely take over your life and, and you knew it was going to be like a hundred percent of what you wanted to do? It was then it was that first tour and quitting that job because since I quit that job, which was 12 years ago I have never worked for anyone again it's just always been all my time in the kingdom of giants before I picked up a camera all my time in the kingdom of giants working for 15 bucks an hour with my tattoo artist but I don't consider that working for anybody that's just literally getting enough money that I need to survive working with my friend doing projects around his house live surviving off a grocery outlet and putting all my time in the kingdom, it just it took over immediately. I was just like, this is what I want to do. And I know there's only one way to do this. And it's just go all in. And so I remember watching when you have that much time to put into it. Yeah. It's it's insane what you can do. And when you have the motivation, as we've heard from everything else you've already done up to this point in your life, watching you handle the merch, like obviously you had other help from people, but with designs to literally doing the shipping to like helping with tour management, helping with mm. recording and doing vocals and all that stuff. For sure. It was massive. And it was probably like what, eight years of 100% of your time, five, yeah. eight. Yeah, and no, at sure. what point did the new career come in where you kind of thought like, okay, maybe I don't want to give a hundred percent to kingdom. I kind of want to build something on the side here or jump into a new venture and start doing videography because you had almost no background except for us just pressing record and being stoked yeah. and like filming as kids. How did that, what inspired that? And so much stuff. It's so crazy. It's so when you're a small band, even when you're a big band, if you can still do this, you still save a ton of money, but it just always helps helps when every member of the band can contribute in some kind of way outside of the creative music process like that's it always starts with the music but there's just so much more to being in a band than that you know it's answering emails and figuring out you know if you're trying to get signed just all the steps you need to take to do that and getting an agent getting a manager but then there's graphics for if you want to sell merch there's the getting a van and keeping van maintenance there's just a million things and there's content and there's photos and there's it just never ends there's so much stuff so we were just so DIY for so long. We all tried to just do that. And I remember being like, if at least one of us can put all of our time into this while other people like, like Julian was working at Hollister, you know, uh, Levi was working at the lake. Like everybody kind of had a job and it was like, if I can just not work like that. And I can just put all our time in. So basically if I can, I basically lived rent free at like a band house and the terms were, I go all in on the band for everybody, you know? So I learned how that main one, learning how to record. That is like the ultimate writing saves you so much money when it comes to mixing and getting your album mixed and out. So I was just going all in on that aspect of like learning how to record. Cause I also had that background. So that was probably the biggest thing that was like helpful. And I just felt like everybody needs like Max was good at graphics. So he would help do the merch. I would do the recording. Like everyone had their little thing that they could contribute. And I always thought that I saw that as I started touring more and seeing other bands on tour, like the successful bands always had that. They always 100%. had somebody doing something else. You know, everybody had their role outside of the band. And I always thought that was super, super important. Yeah. And so, so how did this end up leading into the, into the filming era of your life? 
this was like quality content didn't really matter. Just mu- quality music videos mattered. YouTube was really dominant at that time, but there was no Instagram really. There was no Facebook. I remember when we went on our first tour, we didn't even have a Facebook yet. And I remember Johnny's brother's band dressed in white had a Facebook and they had like a hundred likes or followers on there, whatever it was. And we were like, Oh, we got to start one and we catch up to them. Blah, blah, blah. So we would, so Instagram wasn't even around for the first couple of years. Then Instagram came around and it didn't really matter if it was high quality or not. You just needed to be relevant on there. There was no real algorithm yet. None of that. So it was just a good way to document stuff. But then I started touring a bunch and we started going overseas and stuff. I just wanted to document my life. I was like, I was in, you know, the UK, I was in Germany, I was all over Europe. And I was like, I'm going to do this on my iPhone three or two or whatever it was at the time, you know? So I got a GH four and I got the, I didn't know what I was doing, dude. I got the GH four with the Nikon mount on it. So I had to, so the 18 to 35 lens that everybody uses on the, on that setup back in the day, I had to use an adapter and I had no autofocus when you use the adapter. I got the worst setup you could have possibly got. But it was a G camera at the time. And I just remember like, I was taking photos with it. It wasn't even a photo camera. It was for video, you know, but I just wanted to take pictures. But then I just got, I just got like into it by taking photos and editing them on the road. And then we brought out Jordan Reyes on a tour one time. You remember Jordan? Yeah. The sound dude. And he had the same camera, but he was doing video. And I saw how cool video was and how far it had come in the past 10 years, you know, not having a camera. So then I was just, it started with documenting for my band. Same thing, like getting content for the band. And then we're shooting music videos and I'm learning about it. I'm seeing like music videos get shot. I'm interested in that. I never in a million years thought I was going to be involved in it at all. It was always just a hobby to capture my time of touring around the world, you know? And then I said, then I took a, I think I shot a guitar play through you know, for Julian or Max and Red. Those were horrible. I started doing day in the life videos of Kingdom before the shows. Then I started making tour montages. And they're all so bad. They're all still up too. They're funny to watch and they're cool just to have as memories, you know. And it started to snowball. And then I remember, I don't I don't know what the first thing I got paid to do was. I think the first thing I got paid to do was from Ori. <sighs> And I remember that was from shooting our first music video with Ori was for damaged goods. And I went down and me and him hit it off hella. And then I went home and he posted a couple music videos that he had done after that. And I just texted him or I just messaged him on IG, which is, here's a great, here we go. Going for it type scenario. I just texted him, dude, teach me your ways. I could probably find the text. And he was like, my camera guy's actually leaving. If you want, I'll teach you. And I was, and I know crazy. Holy hell. Yeah. Not many people. I think, I think a lot of people would say what he said, maybe. And what I said, but the next step is what makes it all happen, which is doing it. Yes. And Ori for reference is the guy who you still work with for under and who edits all of the insane videos that they have been creating. And it's just, yeah, that's, that's so wild to lead up to all that. And so would you give a lot of credit to Ori for teaching you? Because I have walked in on you looking at YouTube videos of how to every aspect you could possibly think of thousands of times I've sat at your house and hung out with you while you just had how to videos running in the background. Is it super easy for people to learn just from how to YouTube videos or do you need somebody like that to actually take it to the next level? The YouTube stuff and though it is all up here, but it's the doing it with your hands. You know, like I would look at this podcast set up and like watch it and be like, I wonder how they lit that. And I think I know how to do it. And then I'd watch a breakdown of it and be like, yeah, that's perfect. I know I have the knowledge. That's what I would have done too. And then we come in here and go to set this up. And I'm like, it's way different just doing it than thinking about doing it. So I give credit to myself for taking the time to mentally get everything and put it on get it all in my brain from watching YouTube and all that. You got the fundamentals down. Fundamentals and and knowing I know how to do it, but then the hands on, I mean, I have got to work on literally 
50 to 100, maybe, I don't know, 100, maybe 200. I don't even know how many music videos we've done. And firsthand, set the lights up. Be with someone who I respect as just like such a G with lighting and looks and creativity. And I do remember when I used to just do what he told me to do, but then I remember the shift when he would be like, I'd be like, what do you want me to do? What do you want me to do for lights? And him being like, what would you do for lights? And I'm like, oh God. But it's also the gift of giving he's the gifting creative me. element to it. He's gifting me and he's testing me. And he's like, he's like we've, how many times, how many of these have we done? <clears throat> yep. You should know how to do this by now. Building confidence in yourself. Yeah, for sure. Young grasshopper. Well, it's no yeah. coincidence that the first and second, maybe even third videos that I posted that hit 100K, you had a full featured part that you nice. edited. Nice. Snow monsters in yeah. Japan, you're that first yeah. drone section. Mm-hmm. And then, no, that was the second one. The first one was the backyard video. Yeah, the Vermont one. The torch. And that's all stuff. Yeah, <sighs> super sick. I, I can't even film yeah. in the dark. I don't yeah. even know. How I always know when D Dev footy comes up. I, I think I might have said that before, before you was here. Yeah. That's so funny. They used to be in the comments all the time. But he, uh, yeah, or he was the uh, Miyagi, the, my, the Mr. Miyagi for sure, in controlled lighting. But it was a lot of stuff like that where I never, lights were out of completely out of the picture, which is pointing the camera and it's like filming something cool and making something cool out of it when it's out of your control. You know, mm-hmm. I think the first thing I ever did and got paid for now that I think about it was not with Ori. It wasn't, it was at Mount snow. It was that new year's snow barn, new year's thing with Dossie and he was doing photo, I think. And Cause I you came to video. visit us for the, for new year's and stay up with us. Yeah. What, what do you think is the most fun time that you've ever joined in like helping film with, with the crew like some type of action sports thing that we do oh, japan was super sick because i don't even think i used my camera outside of the house i just used your karma grip and a gopro and i got to just see like show people what was possible with a gopro when you you know gimbal got it when you've you know use the right settings and you grade it and you stabilize it and you think about the shots and expose it right and do the yeah. right white balance but then you made me a full-on cooking video i did make cut, you a full-on the cooking veggies video. Yeah. the yeah, best thing ever is like there's two aspects that d-dub helps me with where it's like he'll just take every clip that he filmed from the day and color grade it and do it all proper and take it all and send it to me and then i kind of piece them throughout my video which i love can, which is dope love that but then you can tell it's like my stuff's all auto and then all of a sudden it's like oh yeah but it's cool because you bounce back and forth between it and it keeps it and it like, throws it in the storyline it's super that. sick and people understand that but it's fucking super dope when the cinematic bars drop in and it's like here we go i'm editing me talking in the car while you're over there editing some insane piece and then when i'm done you're like yo turn the airdrop on and you just airdrop me something and i plug it right in and it's just absolutely magical is like yeah. that's that's the best people ask me all the time what my favorite type like if you had to choose like weddings or music videos or or like uh, commercial stuff like what would you do and i'm like i absolutely have the most fun doing that stuff with you like like when i just f- have my camera there's no plan i just film a bunch of random stuff throughout the day cut together a minute piece send it to you move on you you're know? literally doing what you think is cool yeah, yeah in, in that moment, moment. Yeah. we just got to figure out yeah. how to get you the same bread for doing that <laughs> yeah. as you get for weddings I know. and i how is how's the bisque in like wedding versus music video industry like money wise, yeah. Um, it just depends. Everybody's got a different budget. Sometimes you know. Like, like do you love the wedding thing, or is that strictly just f- to get bread to keep doing the music thing, or how how do you how do you balance all, it's both. all of that? It's for sure both because I don't love doing weddings, but here's what I love: getting comfortable in uncomfortable scenarios. A wedding is the ultimate test for a videographer. And people hate on like wedding cinematographers, whatever, but you are showing up to people that you never met. So you're meeting them for the first time on the most important day of their life that they only get one of. Highest expectations Mm -hmm. you can have. You have to tell them, you have to direct them, people you don't know who have never been on camera before on the most important day of their life to do the most uncomfortable thing on camera that you can do. People don't even like having cameras pointed at them. Now you're having them be intimate on camera and you're usually showing up to a venue that you've never been to. So you have to immediately take in the whole space 
You have to scan the place and see where am I going to do each thing. You And then once you're in that space, you have to have the right time of day. Then you have to have the right prompts to tell these people what to do. You have to become personable with them. You get one shot at everything. You really don't have too much control of lighting. You can bring a light inside and move some stuff around, but you have to use all your knowledge from directing to composition to lighting all in one shot in one day. So it's like, to me, it's the ultimate test. And that's what I like about it. That's insane. Yeah. What's the... What's like drop some some knowledge for the the people trying to get into videography or photography? Yeah. What's like the most important things? Is it doing what you love first and travel and and charging that so that you keep doing it, not getting burnt out? Is it focused on on money? Is it doing stuff for free? What do you got for advice for people? I would do a variety of stuff for free because. That's just how you figure out what you want to do. You know, it's like there's no money involved. So that means you can take as much time on it as you want. You have no excuse for, I could have done better at this if I had more time. Um, there's, you're not pigeonholed or niche or burnt out on doing the same thing. Like try a bunch of different things and do it for free. And while you're doing that, build a portfolio and then use that portfolio of doing the free stuff to show people what you can do. So when someone's like, when you're trying to, get your first thousand dollars for a wedding video and people are like, can I see anything that you've done? You have something to show, you know, it's an, it's an investment for sure. And, and is there like an actual linear time or amount that you should get done before trying to charge and like do rates go up over time or feel it out? I would just feel it out. I don't think there's a set like timeline to it. Do a few things, see what happens, you know, start with a family and friend or something like that. Like for me, the first wedding I did, they had, I think, 300 bucks or something like that. And I went and I showed up there at like 8 a.m. You usually don't get there till like 12 or 1. Mm -hmm. I got there so early because I didn't know anything. And I stayed till I was the last one there. They usually leave like 10 minutes after dancing starts, you know, when they get yeah. dancing footage. So I was just there the whole time. And, I, and then I made a cool video out of it. And they were so hyped. So I had one, you know, and then... 14 hours, 300 bucks for sure. For sure. And Which then, sometimes you don't even get that. Like you were saying, you do the first couple for free because <clears throat> like that's an opportunity to have a wedding video in the portfolio. Exactly. Which is tough to get if you've yeah. never had one. Who yeah. the hell is going to have somebody with zero weddings? Right. But you have to film a wedding to have, you know, so right. you have to give a little bit to yeah. build yourself long term. Yeah. Which is what happened. Like the way, reason I got that wedding in the first place was because I just, I was living up in Sutter Creek, Jackson area. And I just joined a wedding photography, videography, Facebook group. And I just was on there and it was like a referral thing. Hey, need a second shooter, need this, need this. And this girl, Kaylee was like, Hey, there's a couple that has only has a $300 budget. They're not expecting much. Is there anyone that it happens to be in this Jackson area that could do this? And I was like, me, boom, went and did it. And then on that same thing, my friend Cassandra, and I work with both of these people still now. They're like friends of mine to this day. Crazy. My friend Cassandra, who lives down here in LA now, I was up in Jackson and she's like, Hey, long shot, but I have someone who just wants their ceremony filmed, um, in Jackson, California on Saturday. Is there anyone that could come out and film it for like 60 bucks? And I was like, I can, I can do it. And she, and then we got on a call and I was like, Hey, do you think they would mind if I just stayed and made them a free wedding video of their whole day? And she was like, uh, yeah, they would be stoked on that. They just didn't have the money. And I was just like, cool. Can you let them know that I'll just be there and I'll, I'm, I'll, I'll film their ceremony for sure, but I'm just going to make them a wedding video of their whole day. So my second one I did for 60 bucks. So now I had two. Holy moly. Yeah. Fast so weddings forward. are pretty much the intro to, for most, I mean, I'm sure there's so many things you could do. Dude, but. the last thing you should do is do a wedding. You should know exactly what you're doing first with uh, in every aspect before you put someone's only day that is the most important day on the line. You should not have to think about settings. You should have your knowledge of your settings dialed so you can just point your camera and know you should know composition, at least those two things, you know, because whew, I can just imagine there's nothing worse than getting your wedding video back and it being trashed. Yeah. I mean, whew. So I won't be filmed. I, I, I filmed the wedding one time. I don't know nothing about composition, but yeah. I wasn't getting paid. I was just there for a second backup That's camera. Different. Yeah. yeah. You, Granada, bro. Oh, you did? Shout nice. out the boy. Yeah. Nice. Drop.
one more thing I want to touch on while we're talking about advice for kids that are trying to get into filming is you're working on some content right now for a company. You've been trying to make professional grade videos with them for your camera for a while. You have like five, eight, nine made Yeah. yesterday. You left your camera and your SD card somewhere, but there was a perfect opportunity to film another one. You broke out your iPhone and you filmed Verde and it lined up right next to the other clips looked just as good. Maybe a touch off if you're super, yeah. super, you know, mm -hmm. you, like you can actually notice, but what's the level of like investment that you need to make versus learning how to actually use your craft to get the most out of it? What's more important? Oh my God. It is just so much more important to know your craft than it is to have nice gear. I could have a $35,000 camera, $80,000 camera, and I could hand Ori your GH5. He's going to make something better than me. It's just going to happen. He it is so much more about lighting and composition and telling a story than it is about how high quality your camera is. Because if you shoot uh, Ari Alexa into flat lighting, it's going to be flat lighting. If you take your iPhone and shape some light, you're going to have shaped light. And if you tell a better story on an iPhone and you have some random thing you're shooting on a $35,000 camera, it's going to look like what you're doing. What you're doing is going to look like what you did. You know? I knew it. Everybody listening knew it. Everybody who's ever asked that question knew it. And for some reason, humans just want to find an easy way out. Absolutely. Uh, and it has been... This way, this is another key ingredient in life that I learned. And it all this all started from mixing audio and always like, how does Joey Star just get his mixes to sound so fat? It's this, he's doing something. He's doing something that he's not telling us about. But I remember listening to his video tutorial one time and him being like, it's not one big thing that makes my mix good. It's a thousand little things. And that's the same thing with audio. It's the same thing with video. It's the same thing with photos. It's the same thing with unhappiness in life. You can't just move from Northern California to Southern California and think that your life's going to be better. It's the millions of little things along the way. You know, you could have a good life somewhere in the country by making small, all these small changes and just this, the one big easy way out thing is just never the answer in any aspect. And I'm so guilty of it. I remember, like you said, I'm watching all these YouTube videos. Whenever someone would put up this fucking title, it would be like, the secret to filmmaking is this one simple thing. And I'm like, I'm clicking on it. What is it? <laughs> you know? <laughs> what is it? What and is you it? apply Finally. it. Finally. And you apply it. But then I click on it. And you know what it always is? It's for filmmaking. It's always storytelling and i'm just like god it's not a thing i can just buy real quick yeah slap on here a sick color grade it's not a lot it's, it's not, not a lot it's not a transition it's it's not a four thousand dollar lens yeah. instead of a four hundred dollar lens it's the story and i'm just like and i would get so mad when that was i was like what a clickbait thing but then it is the only true answer. Yeah. You know? And there is the aspect of appreciating gear and wanting to know how to use different stuff and use different stuff for different. It's just like with snowboarding, like using different binding and all that. But at the end of the day, if you're trying to work on your riding and get better, yeah. you need to just figure out a board that works for you. Stay on it and never worry about little elements changing. Just worry on yeah. getting better at your riding and yeah. honing in your skills. It's you get to that point. Stuff. You do it at a certain level. Once you've exhausted your knowledge on a certain thing. You're like, I know everything there is to do on this. I want to shoot it on a better camera now and see what I can make, you know? And now maybe that camera has a couple more features that allows yeah. you to. So much with cameras these days is not, uh, we're good. We're good on quality. We're good on the 8K. Mm -hmm. The file sizes are massive. Mm -hmm. No one even knows what to do with it. Mm -hmm. Like where do, the amount of hard drives and all the this Hard stuff, drives aren't getting cheaper. Terabytes it's still crazy. 30 bucks minimum for a terabyte. You it's know what crazy. I mean? And that's not SSD. Yeah. So, I think like, you know, we got four cameras set up here right now. There's also these YouTube videos that go around right now, actually five cameras, a lot of YouTube videos going around about like how to choose the right camera for you. And I, one thing that really resonates with me in those videos is when someone talks about which camera, when you have all four of them there, 
makes you want to go out and shoot? You know, which one do you want to pick up? Which one makes you be like, I want to go shoot something on this thing. And I guarantee you that's never about the quality. You know, it's about, for me these days, it's about like the conveniences and like the things that come with the camera. You oh know? yeah. You know, that's Whether been mine the whole time. Yeah. I mean, how many times have we had to get up and t- restart this camera because it's supposed to have a 30 minute time limit, but it's been cutting off at 20 minutes and 30 minutes is already horrible. Yeah. And that's, it's a multiple hour podcast. It's been rough. So if there's been some cuts, we're sorry. Rubs. We're, we're over here working hard. Like you said, we got five cameras. So yeah. shout out Petter per sorry, usual. Bro. <laughs> we love you, bro. <laughs> the Petter. <laughs> But like, you know, my, my, one of my Sony's over there, I can hook up to my phone and I can use it as a monitor. I can walk around the room. That's more important to me than yes. it shooting in 8K. Yes. I don't got to walk back and forth and move your shirt on the wall 50 times. I can just look and be like, okay, boom, nail yep. it up. And you're different than I am with completely different For needs. Sure. I need my camera to be able to fall from a 12 to 15 <laughs> foot ledge, hit the ground and still run for months. You know what I mean? Yeah. I need wet. it to be able to get soaking wet yeah. with like mist and all, all types of stuff, you know? Um, I, I kind of want to navigate towards like you're making content for other people and you're on such a high level. Is that just like more appealing because it's like you're working with the best artists. And so you're like creating the best content around that instead of trying to create your own content based around you. Yeah. Um, it's just cool. Like I love making music videos. I love seeing the final product. I love working with bands that I've never thought I'd be able to meet. And here I am helping now with their image. And I love being the guy that captures the shot. You know, there's the, the DP, there's the camera op, there's the director, there's the AD, there's the PA, there's the producer. I, the one who physically captures the shot. It's pretty cool. You know, I, I like being like, I was holding the camera made that shot happen, whatever we did, whether we're, whether I'm hanging out of the back of a car and we're driving through the desert or I'm on a tripod and we're shooting green screen. Like I, I did it. You know what I mean? That's literally what I wanted to hear because you enjoy what you're doing. And you said to me and Verde in the car yesterday, how, what was it? He could get kind of some different gigs or you could like uh, acquire more work or make more money honing in on one specific thing, yeah. but your job is kind of to just adjust everything and make sure everybody's dialed in and you could do those other things. But the most crucial thing that you said to me or to us was that you're happy with your life. You like what you're doing. Yeah. And the question before that of me asking, why don't you do it for yourself? is like, I want people to understand that like there's different routes. Some people want to create things for others. Like you said, you want to like you want to bear witness to handing someone something that they can't create themselves or yeah. like what Niso does when he freaking gives you a barrel shot and you're just like, you see the reaction on people's faces and like pick what's good for you, what resonates with you and make sure that you're happy and you enjoy doing it. And that's the only way that you're going to be able to put as much effort and work and time into your craft as you have. Yeah. Is that sure. pretty yeah. much sum that up? Yeah, definitely. So we got a, we got a surprise question here. And um, I think we're going to be stoked on this one. What do we got? A little surprise question. For me? Yeah. What? I'm scared. I guess maybe, maybe first we should explain that the whole metal band and everything that you've been building over 20 years and the electric guitar and the ripping and shredding and mosh bits and stuff is so heavy. And the, recently, whole other aspect, the hoodie that you're wearing, you joined... Right, you didn't create. Yeah, you yeah. joined a band, yeah. and uh, just the most opposite vibe that yep. you could possibly think of from the heavy metal. It's just straight vibey beach stoke. Yeah. Um, how did that? How did that come about? Well, basically, I don't only listen to metal. There's been times in my life where I'm making metal and so burnt out on it. Every time an album comes out, it's like just so exhausting to listen to all the time, you know? And I've, I've always liked rap. I've always liked like dark folk stuff, like, oh, everything. like the war on drugs and, you know, Lord Haran and stuff. And I've always liked rap and I've always liked, you know, Post Malone and Drake. I, I love, classical. I love everything. You freaking put it's some jazz all around. I'm psyching. So just because I was in a metal band, like that's not necessarily the only thing I want to make creatively. And I'm a screamer in a metal band, you know, it's like, obviously I'm more than that, but that's, easy peasy. That's what it is, you know, but I love making like beach pop music. I love listening to Bournes and cannons and stuff like that. It's like so sick. And my friend, Mike, uh, Mike and Sam, I was more friends with Mike. Now I'm just as good friends with both of them, but 
he's the producer for all the music videos and he had his band chief. And I was like, Hey man, you guys ever need a bass player? You ever need a bass player? You ever need a bass player? Let me know. Let me know. And then their vocalist left and he stepped up to be, he stepped up to be the vocalist. So they needed a bass player. And I kept putting it out there to him for like literally two years. And eventually when it happened, he, I was first there. I was first one he thought of. And he's like, you want to join chief? We literally need a bass player. And I got to literally join chief, which is the cool thing is kingdom for better or for worse is my favorite metal band. And chief is my favorite pop beach band. They're my two favorite bands, which I think is cool. You know, I don't think it's weird to be in your favorite bands. You know, it's like you're making what you want to hear. So if you're not, how could it not be your favorite band? So I get to be in both my favorite bands. One of them I do so much for vocals, emails, record, write, tour manage, all that stuff. The other I do almost nothing for. I just get to show up and show up and button up and just making jam. Rocks and bass and make our and but I, it's like I also make all our, like I make our content and stuff, so that's yeah. fun. And shoot the promos. Yeah. And everybody's got they got their gig. And there's not as high stakes with that one, you know. Mm -hmm. So it's like I don't mind shooting all our video stuff, but I can't shoot all our kingdom and stuff. And that's what I always push to people too is when you're first starting off, you're fortunate. Just pump stuff out, like you said. The stakes aren't that high. There's not that many people watching. You're not gonna yeah. let down. You know, you can embarrass yourself or whatnot. Yeah. Well, we have a, a guest call in here. We kind of already answered it, but we needed to address what the question was have even been so here's some <laughs> stuff Ooh, oh Dana, my god yeah. what's the stoke levels baby you guys are out there in the stoke warehouse spreading stoke with the pod love to see it Whew, i got two questions for you oh my god how does it feel to have one of the heaviest bands in the game to one of the most chill laid back kickback music bands in the game too Wake up, rock out, go to bed, chill out. I don't know. <laughs> I woke up jamming the new weather track this morning, and I was just blown away on how sick it was and followed it up right away with the... Doo -doo 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 -doo. <laughs> 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 just want to see how it feels to accomplish your dreams and what you've done with music, video. It's amazing to see it from outside perspective, come in and just, like, be able to crush the most stoked, the most chill and just be a part of that whole music world. How does it feel, bro? Are you stoked? What's your stoke level on it? Hope you guys crush this podcast. Love you. See you soon. We're going to be on the mountain, ripping, stoking in a matter of no time. Let's get it. Jet bro. <laughs> Jet bro. What an absolute hero. <laughs> yeah, Dale. Miss you, Dale. Yeah. What See, a G. You kind of answered it, but how do you, how's it feel? No, dude, it feels good. Um, Yin yang, baby. Yeah. You know, it's like I have one, like, you know, what's funny is people hear them in a band and they'll be like, oh, what's your band? And depending on who I'm talking to, I get to tell them a totally different band. Yeah, you know, that's funny. like, here's what I think Chief is unskippable. You know, you can put that on anywhere, anytime. And you, no one in the room is going to go, what the fuck are we listening to? Yes. You know what I mean? And I'm so musically challenged <laughs> that when I am in those situations, I just calmly put Chief on. Yeah. Someone's in my car. Yeah. I'm like, we're good. I don't have to put on like Led Zeppelin. Oh, they yeah. all know that. I know. Maybe I'm, they don't like classic I'm bad. I only listen to like metalcore. So yep. Chief is a good outlet for me when I have someone in my passenger seat. <laughs> I, got, I, I got a playlist that's literally called regular people music <laughs> and then like campfire music to like yeah. try to fit in. Because literally if you just, I can't just go shuffle and music it's no. good it's you'd be gonna, like oh, oh, something sorry. heavy is gonna happen <laughs> quick <laughs> yeah <laughs> within three tracks happens all the time but yeah that's i do love that i can be like if i feel somebody out i'm like oh yeah and they're like tatted up and stuff i'm like just kind of judge somebody a little bit yeah, <laughs> you know, a little, little judge. musical judge no yeah. big deal i mean <laughs> your mom <laughs> yeah yeah oh, what do i show lauren's grandpa you know what i mean yeah and he's a musician and he plays and i'm just like show him chief and he's like this is awesome yeah i'm like thanks yep it's pretty cool all right did you guys end up coming up with an ask C Dub anything question? Not you guys, but I was thinking about it. When yeah, we didn't do it together, but yeah. you you want to send one to him? I have I have one. All right, all right. This is a uh, Ask C Dub anything presented by Candy Grind. They are the best company in the game. My longest sponsor. They make outerwear, gloves, everything you could need. They dial you guys in with all the accessories, and uh, yeah, they're they're supporting the podcast. What do we got there, Day? All right. 
in this current time of year in November, what major sports are being played right now in America? Ooh, how many are there? I don't know. How many sports are there and how many are being played right now? Can I get a little? <laughs> I mean, you know, like the, I'll just give you, I don't even want to say yeah, them. Know. All right, I'll but say just the big what's ones. being played right now. Yeah, like what's going on? I was on? just in Utah and the boys were watching baseball. It might have just finished, but there was some big baseball stuff going on. Uh, I feel like football's always going on. And they don't they end it in February? So they're going strong. I haven't seen really any basketball stuff. I know hockey's going on. Hockey, baseball, football, no basketball. What else is there? I think you're good. Is that it? I need to research as well. Basketball's <laughs> going. Is it? I think it just started. They're, they might still be preseason or it, or it just started. But I think, I, no, they're playing now. And he's right. The World Series just happened, correct? Yeah, so there's no baseball going down. I think that's over, but recently. <laughs> this is why we need Jamal, because we're over here in China. Dude, he's be so <laughs> Pretty sure it's hockey, yeah. football, and basketball. Yep. Okay, well, or no, not when this episode goes live, we will have this as a, <laughs> a short react. post. We'll have this as a short post on the You Love to Hear It Instagram. Go over there and drop a comment with any question that you want to hear me asked. And if we pick you in the next episode, then you will win. I believe they've given $50 gift cards to the Candy Grind website. So much love to CG Habitats. And uh, yeah, I wonder how we did on that one. I got two questions for you though. What do we got? To ask seed up questions. Oh, let's go. Let's keep it moving. But well, these are not like sports. These are more, these are kingdom related. Oh boy. Okay. I'm not Be good at this. Especially because I know. Oh God. I was thinking about this the other day. You're going to ask me to name a bunch of songs and I don't even know. I'm going to ask you to name, but I, cause I'm specifically asking you because I know you don't know song names. You don't yes. do that. Yes. But I was going to say, if you could, can you remember what like your favorite kingdom song is by name? By name and what, which era? No, but I Brutal. remember there was a specific. I want to say it's off high cast every wave of sound, and it's. I, I literally remember where I was in Lebanon working for Alan Miller. Listen, <laughs> oh, it was then it was definitely off Abominable because that was just so such a drastic point in my life where I was like, I'm going to cut every blade of grass and save every dollar and not hit one beverage and just move to California and make my whole life. But anyways, it was like something to do with like, if you're a king in your kingdom or something mm -hmm. like that, mm -hmm. well, how's the lyric go? You're not my king for sure. Yeah. Oh, it's or just, you're not uh, a king. You're not my king. I know the song. It might've even been red singing that part. Um, you are no king. It's from the Overlord, and I gotta, oh. yeah, I gotta remember. Yeah, that that's like a, a just a special moment that I literally remember working at a group home and being like, "Oh my god, yeah." Um, but I think is it Lost Hills? That's like a chill kind yeah. of drivey, sick yeah. one, and then uh -huh. ends hard as hell. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Probably that might be one of my favorites. Nice. Sick Lost Hills. Mike wrote that uh, that riff, that opening riff of that song. Yeah, there's a lot of good ones. Or, uh, I mean, we had, I almost want to just say, me, me and Verde had song? like, because you dropped um, this the single track. We met at Hood that year. Um, before the album came out. There was just, and it was like, it, you, you didn't drop the album for like four months after that. Of, was it off ground culture? Was it ground culture? No. Yeah, it was the next day, I'll know it. it. All the hell you got to spare. Oh, is it off that album? Yeah, it was one of the first tracks that you released. Cash out, damaged goods. Nope. Before nope. Bleach, it was. It was. There was two singles that came out. I saw it. Out. It's. It's a. It's like yeah. It's like four or five words. It might even have a comma in it. It's so good. Well, off which album? Is it off? This of was in 2018 that? summer. You wow. drop, yeah, single track, and we just we was no faith, no space. Yes, hey, yes. you said single track. There was yeah, a specific time when we would play it at the top, and you'd have like a eight second window to hit the first yeah. jump and set up before you locked yeah. your edge in and just spun. Nice. Doesn't matter yeah. what trick. I'll literally bring up a clip of Verde spinning backside. Spinning. He's just spinning backside. One, three, five, seven, nine, ten, twelve. You see him just go over the, and <laughs> he's just spinning. Gone. I'll never forget that story. Wow. We'll touch on that another time. Okay, nice. that was one. You have another one. Um, I think the other question was going to be, 
I don't know a lot of like, you know, I don't know how many of listeners know kingdom or like know this process. And we put out albums every few years and, you know, in the beginning you talked about how you got to just hear abominable for the first time. You never heard anything about it. It just, you just got to hear it. Right? And that must be so different than now because I'm doing so much of our recording and stuff that the pre-production, you always get to hear the pre-production stages. I can't help, but not show you. Mm-hmm songs along the way but that's really cool too you know like i feel like you get to be a part of the process with us and you finally when it all comes to fruition you get to hear it front to back and it's like do you like hearing it as a whole and never heard it before or do you like being a part of the process it's a mix right having kog before anybody else is just like yeah that's better i'd rather have more (laughs) kog before anybody else yeah because you also hear stuff that never comes out and but then that's what messes me up with the titles because you i end up i'm in the email i download the pre pros and they're all named something and they're named that for three months and then they switch up to three months later and then when they drop they're a completely different name and i'm like i'm over it track seven is the one you know (laughs) and i've always been like a a numbers guy like that growing up when you put the cd in i never knew what the actual one Mm -hmm. was but i knew song six and song 11 bangers um so i would i would say yeah being a part of that process is sick giving you real feedback yeah like in the cars yeah that's 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 fun for for sure fun for me for sure Sick. Extra long one for Candy Grind because they've been extra long supporting the boys. All right. We've heard a lot of insane things. We've heard multiple bands, multiple just crazy ventures across the country committing to jobs and committing to careers and just making like massive moves and skateboarding and getting out of your comfort zone, just doing all this wild stuff, create like creating businesses, starting to learn weddings, starting to scream out of nowhere, getting on stage, not knowing an album. Like I literally could just keep going, getting in the booth and recording an album word for word without knowing like anything. Just where does this all come from? Where is all the motivation? Like I was telling Bear Day earlier that like, just you hang out with you like you you can't physically see like a tangible like oh that's that's what that is he's trying to accomplish that or get that done it's just like consistent work we were talking about it yesterday it's just like you walk around until you see something as soon as you see it you just start knocking it out until it's done and if you're halfway done you see something else it's like just constantly grinding like where does that motivation stem before from. just to add to that you're just I, i see this pattern just listening to your whole life you're so resourceful because you know it's only you you don't have a backup you don't have some like someone with a bunch of money to hand you in case something goes wrong yeah so in all these scenarios why'd you start filming well we kind of needed somebody to film so i picked it up why'd you start doing this because uh, it would help me yeah. so like you're really resourceful it's but yeah touching on all but, that but like, what takes it to that next level to yeah. where you know that it's not going to get done if, if you don't do it and you do it i mean for starters I love everything that I do. So that's where my motivation comes from. I love making music. I love editing photos. I love editing videos. There's no part where I'm doing it where like the only reason that I'm like, I got to get this done is because I'm trying to get it to my client, whoever whoever that may be. But while I'm working on it, finishing it is not for anybody but the client. You know, it's not for me. I like editing. I like shooting. I like it all. I love all of it. So it starts there. I don't do anything in my life that I don't like, which is cool. Um, I mean, I do tons of stuff I don't like. I got to go to the DMV. I got to go to the freaking grocery store 10 times a week, you know, but you know about the ice plunge. I do that. I actually like that. I like that too. Yeah. You you, you learn to like the torture. Yeah. The gym. Yeah, I like everything that I do. I think that starts there. But, you know, if it if I go back further, you know, it's like I've lost my dad and I've lost my brother. And I know you feel the same way with this where it's just like we've always had this. Remember that? Remember that picture frame? How it got how it cut off? I think Lauren Macaluso got it for us. And it says it's supposed to, it says we do we do for you. But it's supposed to say what we do, we do for you, but it's cut off in yes. that way. And it just says, we do, we do for you. And it was a photo of us uh, like kneeling down, hands locked at Nagel Point. Yeah. And I just, I, it's, it's that. It's like, like my dad would love to be here. 
my brother would love to be here, but they can't. So it's like, I, I don't, that's what started. It was just like, I got to live for our, I got to live for two of us now. I got to live for three of us now. Like I'm not letting this, I get to be here and you guys want to be here. I got to make the most of it. I think that's, that was the hugest, the biggest part that you just said was you just, that's, that's what started it. Started it. And that's what people have the biggest problem with. Maybe they don't have some drama or traumatic thing in their life that forces them or gives them a new perspective to start it. So the biggest thing I would give people advice with is if you're in a lull or if you're down or if you don't know what to, what to do or you're depressed or whatnot, it's just like move, get up, go, start, do something. And the momentum from there flows. And like you said, we lost our father and it was like we had no choice this is what we're going to do at such a young age. Like that was developing who we were. So during those like crucial times of our life, when we're like growing and shaping how we're going to be, we're shaping the fact that we're going to put in three times the amount that we can every day for all of our, our family members that aren't here that can't do it. And I think that's just huge. The fact that you said like, that's what started it. Yeah unconsciously. And then that just ended up being habit. And we all know how you get in bad habits and then months go down the road. And when you switch those habits, you're in the gym every day and like everything starts rolling, but it's all about just like, get it going. Just, it's going to be tough, but push through and start to yeah. get, to get that, go, that ball rolling. Yep. Cause now it's like, I don't wake up and go shoot a wedding and think, God crush this for dad. You know what I mean? <laughs> it's not what it is now. Now it's, I use that to position myself to doing things that I love. And now I'm just doing things that I love. And in the beginning, I wasn't doing things. I, this is a Gary V thing. It's like, do what you love and the money will follow, you know, figure out a way to monetize it later. If you're doing what you love, you're, if you're doing what you love, you're surrounding yourself with that thing, which is going to create more opportunities and open more doors for you. You're going to be like, if you want to be a professional dancer, but you are scared that I'll never make any money in this. Go take a dance class because now you're around 15 other dancers. One of those people you come friends with, you meet someone through that person, doors, doors, doors. And my life is literally that. We pretty much, we pretty much handled it. And we got a one more banger feature question here for you. All right, cool. I feel like this is like, we, you, you said it in the beginning, you're like, what is something that like, we got to put stuff on this list that you want to make sure you don't miss. And, and you're just right. It's like, we just, you could just spend this much time on each thing that we talked about, but we have to just fly through it. It's Which crazy. Is, why, if you guys want more of these show and love, dropping reviews, dropping comments, if you're subscribed on the YouTube channel, show and love is like, we'll, we'll be back in the booth and keeping these things going. If you guys are stoking and supporting. Yeah. So we, we do appreciate you guys. And here we go. We got a guest call from a legend. What's up, guys? Wow. Dossie here. Stoking on the You Love to Hear It podcast D Dub special. Wow. I got a call in question. I want to know 10 year goals for Dana. When you're 45 years old, what are we doing? Where are we going? What are we dominating? Is Dana still in the music scene? Is he filming movies? Is he working on giant commercial productions? What's the goal? What are the dreams? 10 years out, give it to me. Have a great episode. You. Heavy question. <sighs> the gnarliest, most brutal question ever. Because if you asked me when I was 20, it, may, it might have been owning that painting company. And then he asked me when I'm 25, it might be blowing up Kingdom of Giants as big as I can and just literally touring the world forever. And then when you ask me when I'm 30, it would be shooting music videos for the biggest bands in the scene and just wanting to dive into music videos. And if you ask me when I'm 32, it would be, I want to own a wedding business where I don't do any of the work, but I make all the money. You know, it's like, but now you're 35. Now I'm 35. And I don't know because I like my life right now, but I know that at some point I kind of have to choose some sort of path because... You know, I, I, what I, I can tell you what I don't want to be doing. You right. can't just be the best boy of everything. Exactly. You can't, you can't, because that's how people like, you want to blow up your, your Instagram page. Like I'm the definition of never going to have a big Instagram page because all it is, is a gigantic variety of stuff. If red, my guitar player just posted him playing kingdom of giants riffs every single day, his page would blow up. Right. You know, it's like, you have to have your niche is what it is. And Casey's niche is just doing what he wants, which is sick. If you can make that happen, that's kind of mine too, but it's not really a niche for me. So I, 
I can, I, I don't necessarily know what I want to do in 10 years, but I know what I don't want to do. I know I don't want to be physically being a 45 year old man with a gimbal filming 22 year old people's weddings. You know what I mean? I know I don't want to do that. I don't want to be breaking my back, being the one filming music videos for, you know, it's like, I think the world is going to change so much in the next 10 years that something is going to happen within those 10 years. That's going to be what I end up doing and where I would want to be. Does that make sense? <laughs> Fate, baby. Yeah. I don't think what I'm going to be doing in the next 10 years exists yet. That's the best thing I've ever heard. Well, one question that all the boys want to know is, will we ever get a full season at a D-dub? <laughs> at a resort? Know. Two, three months. <laughs> Vermont. See, Maybe post, Vermont. Post up near a mountain. Yeah. I talk about East Coast all the time with Lauren, man. It's crazy because I've lived, you know, in the East Coast, I've lived in Northern California, Southern California, and I've just been everywhere. And it's it's really hard to just like moving sucks. It's such a hard thing to do. You got to restart everything. You know, you you feel comfortable, and it's like I've seen a bunch. I've seen everywhere, but you know, I want Lauren to experience more before we just settle down somewhere forever. And I'm like, I tell her recently, I'm like, well, you can't go your whole life without spending two years in New England. Yes. We have to move to New England and we have to do it now. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? And we have to just live there for a couple of years. And if we love it, we stay. And if we want to come back, we can come back. But now's the time. It's like, so that would be the best shot right there. That's of getting a full season. Or if we move back up to NorCal and I like live in Grass Valley or something, then I can come up to Tahoe all the time. Yeah, that'd be sick. Yeah. What about Avo Barrel? Yeah. <laughs> Let me put it this way. I did 26 weddings last year and I did six this year so that I could focus more time on things I love to do and get caught up, which I've been able to put in a lot more work in a kingdom, which is sick, a lot more downtime in my life and just slowing down and appreciating and what I'm working on and picking up other projects. Um, Avo is on the list a hundred percent already have all the designs. I just can't find the time. I haven't made a can't find the time is such a bad excuse. I haven't made it a priority to get it done and focus my energy on that. It needs to be done 100%. Other things are just high on the priority list right now, which is getting people caught up on things that they paid me to do and then also getting a new Kingdom of Giants record out. There it is. That's yeah. what we wanted to hear. The light just went off. That's, yeah, the fact that's that cool. the light went out on the last question is that's, cool. that's what we needed to hear. That's All cool. right, where where do you want people to come through? You want them on the Instagram, the YouTube? Where, where's the Stoke at? Yeah, my Kingdom of Dana IG is where I hang out the most. You know, I don't have TikTok. Um, I've just missed the train on on that mentally. I just can't. I just can't. Yep. I'm just, I'm the Sam Shattuck Same. of that. Sam Shattuck and Andy Kent and all my, Joe Brayman don't have Instagram. You know what I mean? Yeah. I at least have Instagram. You yeah. know, I can't believe they don't have that to keep in touch. You know, yeah. that's crazy. Yeah. yeah. You know, but I just, I'm not, that's one thing I just can't see. Like I'd rather move into the woods and disappear than, than start trying to build a following on something else. And I have mad respect for anyone else doing that and trying to do that. I just have different, uh, self-awareness. Yeah. It's the most important thing you could have. Well, yeah. you got the YouTube sometimes drop some banger. Videos. Yeah. It's more, yeah. It's more just like what I'm feeling, you know? Yep. Oh. I drop all my wedding videos on there just so people can see them, you know, and I drop, I've done like two reviews, which I think actually could work kind of cool, you know, and a new camera comes out. I'm stoked. I'll go yeah. test it out, throw a video up there. Sick. So we'll, we'll link the YouTube, the Instagram. We got kingdom of giants, listen to some heavy metal, get your, get your shit done that you didn't want to do. Yep. And then once you're done, throw on some chief, chill out. And uh, yeah, dude, so sick to have you. Any, anybody you want to thank any, any stoke you want to throw out there to wrap it up? Everybody, man, everybody that I talked to, starting with Courier, to Sumil, to Mike Druskovich, to you, to just all the boys along the way, even in Niso, just everybody has done something in some way. Jamal, Kirby, just everybody in my life. Yeah, all the of more Kingdom, names you throw out, the more names you want to throw I'm out. I fucked. I fucked yeah, and yeah, started, yeah. and now I can't stop. <laughs> Danny, yeah. Johnny, yeah, Bobby, <laughs> Ricky, Susie. Yeah. <laughs> Well, we're yeah. stoked to have you, bro. We'd love to have you on another episode and and run into more because it's so detailed. And um, yeah, I feel like you threw some amazing insight for the people. Show some love. If you guys are listening or watching on YouTube, we're on all the platforms. Subscribe, 
write a review. It means the world. CaseyWillax.com to cop some. You love to hear it merch and to check out where we're going to be. We love you guys. We'll hear, we'll see you in the next one. Peace. You love to hear it. You love to hear it. Zetia. Woo. Yeah, nice. Nice. <laughs>